Good morning or good day and welcome to the Society of Wetland Scientists December 2020 webinar entitled SWS History 40 Years of Globalization, which will be presented by Kathy Yule and a group of wetland scientists and leaders from around the globe. Fred Ellery, Louisa Ricarte, Wei Ta Fong, Max Finlandson, and Jillian Davies. My name is Kim Ponzio and I'm a past president of SWS and currently the SWS webinar committee chair. And I'm pleased to moderate this webinar today and engage you in an e-learning experience with SWS. This is during a time when many of us are looking for those virtual opportunities to stay engaged. And this is one way to stay connected to the wetland community during the global pandemic. And we hope you are all doing well. I wanna offer a special welcome to any non-member guests we have joining us today. All of our webinars are complimentary to SWS members, but once a quarter, we open it up to the public like we're doing today. Our next free quarterly webinar will be held in March, 2021, entitled Urban Wetland Initiatives, Increasing Resiliency of New York City Salt Marshes and presented by Ellen Hartig. But before we get started with our presentation today, I'd like to give our guests a quick overview of what SWS is all about. And as you can see on this slide, our mission is to promote the understanding, conservation, protection, restoration, science-based management, and sustainability of wetlands. Since its founding in 1980, the International Society of Wetland Scientists has continued to grow with around 3,000 members from more than 60 countries around the world. We have a diverse membership hailing from all sectors of wetland science, academia, practitioners, consultants, government employees, NGOs, and a large sector of students. SWS membership includes full access to the Wetlands Journal, our trade journal, Wetland Science and Practice, and other professional journals such as Wetlands Ecology and Management. In addition, SWS members enjoy discounted rates for the SWS Professional Certification Program, access to regional chapter and section activities, student programs and grants, and discounted registration at SWS annual meetings, whether those be in-person or more recently virtual. And all of this provides members the opportunity to network with wetland professionals from around the world. So please visit our website at sws.org to learn more about becoming a member if you're not one already and learn about all of our member benefits. And for those of you who may not be as familiar with our SWS webinar series, we have monthly webinars that, use, that are usually held about the third Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern time, U.S. Eastern time. And as you can see on this listing of our upcoming webinars, we have both our regular SWS webinar series in English, and we also have quarterly webinars offered in Spanish, which are open to members and non-members alike. And our webinars are also posted on YouTube for free viewing. And we have an amazing library of over 60 different webinars on there, and they're really getting a lot of playtime during the pandemic, so you might want to check that out. Another expansion of our program is the development of wetland interviews, so make sure to keep that on your radar. We are proud to recognize our SWS webinar series sponsors for 2020, finishing up the year. We have the Water Resources, Hydrology, and Hydraulics Education Group which is a nonprofit group that shares information on water resources, hydrologic and hydro uh, hydraulic engineering to help educate and build a better tomorrow. And the Whittington Group, which is a natural resource consulting firm that balances regulatory compliance with sound ecological management. And you can find their information on the website listed on this slide. Also, we'd like to recognize in situ, in situ monitoring equipment and software works together to make it easier and more cost effective to collect, access, manage data on water levels, water quality, water flow, and more. And WildNote, which is a field data collection app for environmental professionals that streamlines the process of collecting, managing, and reporting environmental data so you can work smarter, not harder. So please visit, like, and follow our SWS 2020 webinar sponsors. So we have had a first successful year of sponsorships and we're happy to announce that three of those sponsors will continue their support in 2021. But what that means to you is that we have just two sponsorship slots open for 2021. 
The webinar sponsors receive recognition in the webinar promotional items, including emails and advertisement on the SWS webinars webpage, verbal recognition like this during our live webinars, and then exposure from on-demand webinars as they're posted to the YouTube page. The annual sponsorship rate is $1,000 and sponsorship, again, is limited to five sponsors. So please contact Jordan Hogg as soon as, as soon as possible to partner with SWS to bring important and relevant information to the wetland community. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. The general format for today's webinar will be about a 60 minute presentation by our speakers followed by approximately 20 to 30 minutes for questions and, and discussion among the panelists. And all attendees have been muted during the duration of the webinar. I do just wanna remind our speakers to make sure they mute their microphones and turn off their video cameras when they're not speaking. Um, the, for question and answers, uh, these will use, you'll use the Q&A button like you see on the slide. Do not use the chat button. That will be used for technical difficulties that will be monitored by SWS staff. And, and at any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A button or pane. And remember, as you can do this as each of the speakers are uh, talking so that you, you can remember them. Participants may also upvote the questions in the Q&A that they want to be answered earlier. And since we have multiple speakers, if you would please indicate to whom the question should be asked, and that can include the entire panel. And at the end of our Zoom meeting, a survey will pop up and we ask you to fill that out and give us feedback about today's webinar and the SWS webinar program. And additionally, please indicate if you'd be interested in giving a future webinar in 2021. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathy Yule today. Kathy is a professor emerita at the University of Florida in the United States. She earned a Bachelor of Arts from Cornell University and a PhD from the University of Florida. For 20 years, she's worked on forested wetlands in the Southeast as a faculty member at the University of Florida. For 11 years, she worked on freshwater forested wetlands and mangrove forests and in the US affiliated Pacific Islands as a research ecologist with the USD a forest service in Honolulu, Hawaii. She is a fellow and past president of SWS, and she also recently published a history of SWS entitled Society of Wetland Scientists, The First 40 Years, which can be found in the July issue of the Wetland Science and Practice Trade Journal. So I'd like to thank Kathy for organizing the webinar with our esteemed panelists from around the globe today. And with that, I'm gonna hand over control to Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Kim. And welcome to all of you joining us for this webinar on globalization of SWS. First, I will give a brief introduction to the history of SWS efforts to become an international society. Then we will hear from three representatives of SWS chapters, Fred Ellery from the Africa section of the international chapter Luisa Ricaute from the Latin America chapter. Ooh, I should start my video. So we'll hear uh, first from, let's see, let's see if I can get my video to come up. Well, I'll just go on and talk. Uh, Luis, uh, Luisa Recaute from the, uh, from the Latin America and Caribbean section of the international chapter and Waitao Fang from the Asia chapter. Max Finlayson will then describe our collaboration with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And finally, Jillian Davies will give us a taste of what may lie ahead. In 1972, it really would be nice if I had my video here. Let me see if I can find myself. Um, Kathy, we can see you. Your video okay. is working fine. Okay, great. I'm looking at Kim, which is very nice. So <laughs> we're, all, we're all happy. <clears throat> in, uh, in 1972, uh, the US Congress passed the Clean Water Act, which mandated uh, protection and management of the nation's um, wetlands and waterways. 
uh, Richard uh, and the, the, um, the Environmental Protection Agency and the US Army Corps of Engineers were the two agencies that were responsible for, um, uh, for carrying out that mandate. Richard McComber was an employee for the, uh, for the Army Corps of Engineers and he was uh, delegated to, let's see, the, these things are moving ahead on their own, which they should not. Um, <clears throat> uh, led, uh, so it was Richard's job uh, to give workshops and short courses on wetlands for government employees, private consultants, and anyone else who was interested. Uh, during this time, uh, he often, and I should, I should point out, this was not an easy task because wetland itself was not a common word. Um, let's see, Jordan, my slides are advancing and they shouldn't be. There we go, thank you. The, um, so, uh, one, so when Richard started teaching these, these short courses, it was very hard to find information about wetlands. We all know about marshes, we knew about swamps, we knew about bogs, but we really didn't recognize the fact that these were all parts of one, um, components of one large category called wetlands. And a lot of the information that, that we had, and there was a lot of information, was found in the grade literature and reports and in other languages and so forth. So he did a great job in pulling things together. And he would often muse as he, as he talked with his uh, students about his desire for a society dedicated to the exchange of new information. And so in 1935, that, um, and whoops, I went too far. Okay, thanks. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in 1980, 35 members got together in Tampa, Florida for the very first meeting of the Society of Wetland Scientists. 20 years later, the society had grown by two orders of magnitude and it included not just government, government employees and um, private consultants, but academics, planners, uh, a pretty wide variety of, of, of people. From the very beginning, the society wanted, it, wanted this organization to be international. And virtually every president uh, who has, who has um, helped guide the society has, has done something to advance this, uh, the globalization. We got off to a good start when Walter Glushenko, our second president, um, joined us because he was a Canadian. In 1985, the international chapter was formed. Each of the US members uh, was automatically put into a chapter depending on where they lived, um, but we needed a, a place for the international members uh, to have a chapter themselves. And so the, the, uh, the international chapter was formed at that time. In 1989, President Gene Silberhorn initiated gratis memberships. These were memberships given at no cost for full benefits of membership. Uh, and as many as 1% one, 1 of the society membership could, um, could join as gratis members. Uh, they, they, uh, and they could belong for, for three years. And so the hope was that they would receive the bulletin, the newsletters, the journal, and they would spread it around to their colleagues to, to let them know about this society. The International Committee uh, formed in, in the mid 90s uh, to try to, to um, provide more information to the society in general about international affairs. Uh, President Duncan Patton rewrote the, the bylaws and the standing rules in 1997 in order to make them appropriate for the international members. I think the person who probably did the, the, uh, the most um, per individual was Bill Strever, who took over as chair of the International Committee. And he, he, uh, he had a, an article, a column in the SWS Bulletin every, um, um, every, for every issue. Uh, he, he fostered the, the uh, collaboration with the Ramsar um, Convention on Wetlands, which we'll hear more about later. Uh, he made sure that there was an international symposium uh, at every meeting. He really uh, brought the international issues and our, our international members uh, to the front of our attention. 
In 2006, the membership fees were restructured for less developed countries so that people could, could, um, could apply for, for full membership uh, at a, a cost that was appropriate for their economic situation. So in 2019, we had 469 members. Canada, of course, was the first, um, the, the first chapter um, formed in 1984. The international chapter, as I mentioned before, was, was formed in, in 1985. And just recently, within the last couple of years, uh, it has been divided into an Africa section and a Latin America and Caribbean section to give these members a little bit more focus. And we'll, we'll hear more about this later. Australia joined in 2000, and when they uh, when they included New Zealand and other major Pacific uh, islands, uh, they became the Australasia chapter. Now, the, the um, Australasia is a very precise geographic term, Max Finlayson tells me, uh, and it refers to, to those lands south of Asia. But obviously, it was confusing to membership who didn't realize this. And so they renamed themselves Oceania in, in 2013, and they've been a very strong uh, member throughout. Uh, Colombia tried to form a chapter, um, but, but after four years, it was unable to, to sustain itself. Uh, Europe formed a chapter in, in 2004, and they've been quite a strong chapter. Asia came in, in in 2005, and we'll hear more about that in a little bit. South America tried again for a, a, a chapter from in 2013, but that could not be sustained. And China is our most recent chapter uh, formed in, um, in 2017. So um, in the last few years, a concerted effort was made by uh, presidents Kim Ponzio, Julian Davies, and Arnold Vandervoort uh, to really get things moving. Uh, so Arnold chaired an ad hoc committee uh, when he was president elect or before he became president. And what they found were, were major differences in language and currency. Europe, for instance, lots of languages, lots of different currencies, same thing with, uh, with Asia. And it could be very difficult to, to um, manage a society uh, that was based in yet another country. Uh, and then there's the problem of communication over large areas. And Canada had this right from the very beginning. Uh, and it still is a problem. Having electronic access to each other has been wonderful. Uh, but still, it, it really helps to be able to see each other uh, in order to bond. The discussions uh, brought up several points. Um, they could look at formal agreements with related international groups, and we'll hear, hear more about this in a few minutes. Um, the relationship with Ramsar should be enriched. Uh, international activities pro uh, proposed by the, the uh, professional sections could be, could be funded. And finally, there should be an international plenary speaker in each annual meeting. So uh, what, we'll, what we will do now is move to hear about the value of the, of the Society of Wetland Scientists to the Africa chapter. And this will be given by Fred Ellery. Fred works in the geography department at Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa, having spent in research in the field of wetland science, management, and restoration. He has published widely and co-authored a book, A Field Guide to Plants of the Okavango Delta, and he supervised about 60 master's and doctoral level students. He considers his expertise in the origin of wetland landforms to be his greatest strength, and he argues that water that produces biogeochemical conditions necessary for wetlands also alters valley or pond morphology, thereby fundamentally contributing to wetland landform development. This field has not been a strong focus amongst wetland scientists, but it is essential if wetlands are to be sustain sustainably managed. Fred is a longstanding member of the SWS and was briefly a co-chair of the international chapter. There is little that he enjoys more than thinking and talking about or walking through a wetland. So Fred, I hand it over to you. Hi, I'm Fred Ellery. I'm from Grahamstown in South Africa, and I'm going to be talking about the value of the SWS to the African chapter. So 
my own work and experience and relationships with wetland scientists that I have developed over the years have been mainly confined to Southern Africa. So I can't really claim to speak on behalf of the continent, but I hope that in this narrative, the case studies that I present will illustrate the fact that the SWS in Africa punches way above its weight. So these two maps show African membership by country. The map on the left shows current membership. Um, you'll see that a total of 28 members um, currently are African. Most of them come from South Africa and Nigeria. Kenya and Botswana are also well represented. And four other countries have one member each. So this means a total of eight out of 40 countries have members of the SWS. Historically, the picture is somewhat similar. Um, a total of 125 members have been African, mainly represented by South Africa, Nigeria and Kenya, um, Ethiopia, Uganda and Botswana and Ghana have also had been well represented and a number of other countries have had fairly limited membership. I canvassed the current membership and of the 28 members, seven responded with their views on what the values of membership are to them. So all of the respondents benefited from the journal Wetlands and also from the journal Wetland Science and Practice. A number have taken advantage of small grants and have attended conferences. A number have built relationships with other wetland scientists internationally. And a number, number have attended webinars and viewed those as valuable. And one member is currently registering as a professional wetland scientist and he views as a, that as a particularly important part of his membership. So I want to talk about a number of cases where individual membership has led to outcomes beyond what one would expect, perhaps. So I'm going to talk about George Begg and his role in promoting wetland inventory in South Africa. I'm going to talk about Paul Mafabi and wetland stewardship in Uganda and beyond. I'm going to talk about my own experiences and what I've learned and contributed to wetland restoration in South Africa through the SWS. I want briefly to talk about professional membership and the emerging collaboration between the South African Wetland Society and the Society of Wetland Scientists. So the society played an important role in South Africa from the late 1980s through the 1990s when the wetland field of practice in South Africa was in its infancy. And this was achieved largely through George Begg. He joined the SWS to make contacts in wetland inventory and policy given the fact that he was working on wetlands within the region, regional planning domain and wanted wetlands to be protected and wanted to develop appropriate policy in the province. The work in KwaZulu-Natal informed national efforts in the mapping, inventory, conservation planning and protection of wetlands, such that in 2011, an atlas of freshwater ecosystem priority areas in South Africa was produced with provincial maps designed to support sustainable development of water resources and to protect these freshwater ecosystem priority areas. Paul Mafabi was very involved with the society and regularly attended SWS conferences in the 1990s and beyond. 
I'm sure that many senior scientists at that time will remember Paul because he engaged with those scientists and developed many skills and ideas that he took home. Sadly, he passed away in September 2020 as a consequence of COVID-19 infection. The obituary by the UNDP was entitled Mafabi, the wetlands conservation icon, signs out. It reveals his contribution to wetland conservation and stewardship in his own country and beyond. So just to briefly summarize some of his achievements, he was Director for Environmental Affairs and Commissioner for Wetlands in Uganda. He was the National Coordinator for the project Building Resilient Communities, Wetland Ecosystems and Associated Catchments in Uganda. This project seeks to restore wetlands and increase the resilience of both ecosystems and nearby communities. Prior to his retirement in 2017, he had served in several roles, which included coordinating the implementation of the flagship global ecosystem-based adaptation project. His sphere of influence was now reaching far beyond Uganda. He was a member of the Supervisory Council of Wetlands International. He was involved with the work of the Ramsar Convention in Uganda for more than 20 years. And under his leadership, Uganda was the first country in Africa to develop a national wetland policy. Practical experience from community-based wetland management projects helped Paul to allow Uganda to take a leading role in demonstrating that wise use and conservation of wetlands is achievable. In my own case, um, I built up relationships with scientists around the world who shared similar interests, and I did this during SWS International Conferences. One such person was Arnold von der Falk, who twice visited me following his attendance at the annual South African Wetland in Dada. We went on trips to various wetlands and spoke much about wetland restoration, since at that time I was coordinating a national research program on this subject. The research program produced the Wetland Management Series, which is widely used in the state-funded program Working for Wetlands, which has a primary focus on wetland rehabilitation across the country. Much was learned from Arnold and other SWS members that fed into the thinking that is reflected in these products. The products are still used to support planning, implementation, and monitoring of wetland rehabilitation work in the country. The South Africa, South African Wetland Society and the SWS are increasingly collaborating. So the SAWS was formed in April of 2012. Prior to this meeting, a referendum was held amongst potential members where we were asked, where we chose not to be affiliated to the SWS. Since then, with two South Africans being co-chairs of the international chapter, the societies have drawn closer. In 2018, Arnold van der Falk met with the SAWS chair and others at the South African National Wetlands in Dava and the SWS agreed that for a portion of the SAWS annual membership fee, certain privileges could be extended to members of the SAWS. And so the notion of affiliate membership to SWS was born. Affiliate members have certain privileges, but they do not have all the privileges that are extended to full members of the society. So 182 members of the SAWS are now affiliate members of the SWS. Stimulated by the training and certification programs of the SWS, an increasing number of courses are offered for certification and accreditation of professionals. These are registered with a professional body and they earn participants credits for professional development. 
In time, it's likely that something similar to the professional wetland scientists of the East and the US will emerge in South Africa. So, African members of the SWS are very limited. And the distribution of members is unrelated to wetland distribution or the needs for wetland scientists in many countries. But I hope I've illustrated through a number of cases that despite this limited membership, the Society of Wetland Scientists has achieved outcomes that punch way above the weight of the members. And I think this is something that is worth noting. So thank you for attending and please enjoy the rest of this session. Thank you very much, Fred. That was very, very interesting. So now we'll move on to talking about Latin America and the Caribbean. Dr. Luisa Recalte has degrees in environmental sciences from the Comenius University of Bratislava, the Slovak Republic, and in geographical information systems from the District University of Bogota in Colombia. She received her PhD in sciences from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. She has more than 25 years of experience working in wetland science, ecosystem management, and sustainability sciences. In Colombia, she worked for the Amazonian Institute for Scientific Research, where she led projects in wetland ecology and classification, biodiversity conservation, and landscape ecology. Thereafter, she was based at the EAWAG in Switzerland as a PhD student, where she conducted research on wetland and river science with a strong emphasis on participatory and transdisciplinary approaches, and she conducted projects in Colombia, Brazil, and Europe. Currently, Luisa is a freelance consultant for governmental agencies and private companies in Colombia, and since 2013, she has worked as a senior consultant for the Alexander von Humboldt Biological Resources Research Institute in Bogota. Her most recent contributions in Colombia include the coordination of the national assessment of ecosystem functions, services, and drivers in wetlands, and of the wetland classification system, which she joined with the Brazilian wetland classification system. Luisa, together with other South American scientists, promotes a common conservation policy for the wise use of wetlands. Luisa. Hi, everyone. My name is Luisa Ricarte, and today I am very happy to commemorate with you all the 40th anniversary of the Society of Wetland Scientists. Since I joined the SWS in 2009, I have been working for the promotion of our society in Latin America. And during this time, I had the great opportunity of being the co-chair for the Latin American in the Caribbean section from 2016 until 2019. Our chapter has had a very singular development. And in the following, I am going to present you some interesting points about our work. As we all know, the international chapter covers countries from all continents. And there have been done several efforts for the creation of a unique regional chapter in Latin America. In this sense, in 2002, two Colombian wetland scientists, Orlando Mora and Herman Andrade, founded the Colombian chapter, but it was not successful. Then, in 2009, a group of 25 South American wetland scientists from Argentina, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and Chile founded the South American chapter, which ran for only two years. Unfortunately, the complexity of the region, its extension and the lack of financial resources limited the mobility and the for the execution of activities to promote SWS. Finally, in 2016, at the International Wetland Conference in China, Intercol, two good friends of mine, Kim Poncio and Gillian Davis, 
invited me to promote the South American chapter again, which I obviously accepted and founded it for Latin American and the Caribbean. Considering the previous experiences, my work focuses mainly on ways to easily reach a large number of people and thus make visible the SWS in the field of wetland science, which really moves in an incredible manner in Latin America. There exist many groups working for wetlands in rural and urban areas. However, while wet language should not be a barrier, the promotion of a scientific society of North American origin does represent a great challenge for a continent where Spanish is the predominant language and Portuguese in a smaller proportion. Therefore, in 2016, I set up a strategy based on the production of informative material in Spanish, on the intensive usage of the social media, and on the active participation of SWS members at the regional wetland science events. The achievement of these objectives had the unconditional support of other SWS groups. Thus, we have produced a logo and a brochure in Spanish, and we have also participated in different events, both physically or virtually, in Colombia, Cuba, Brazil, Peru, and Mexico. The SWS has granted different hours to participants, and the chapter also leads an important participatory process at the second Wetland Congress in Colombia, where came out the NAVA Wetland Declaration as a tool for the conservation of the wetlands in the Andean region in Colombia. As a part of the internationalization process, different tools have been performed which contribute to socialize and spread the SWS activities and aims. For example, in 2016, I created a Facebook page, which has a great impact reaching an important number of people working in wetland research, conservation and management. By the same token, there was adopted the SWS webinar series, but in Spanish. It started in 2017 with a fantastic first talk given by the professor Wolfgang Jung. Since then, prominent Latin American wetland scientists such as the professor Juan Jose Neib and professor Alicia Poy have participated in our talks. Our section also supports students by fellowships in the frame of the Wetland Ambassador Program. The Latin America section also participates at the SWS annual meetings. And finally, in this year, a complete issue of Wetland Science and Practice was published with short notes and research papers from Latin America. Our section also supports the SWS Professional Certification Program. We expect that next year many wetland scientists and practitioners will do this certification. We are convinced that this program represents as well a job opportunity. Now, let's talk about the SWS membership in Latin America and the Caribbean. I see that in spite of the efforts and work done, the number of 
the members in the region continues to be very low. We see that from 2017 until 2020, the number of members didn't change extraordinarily. I personally consider this to be the neuralgic point of the international chapter. For this, I recommend the creation of regional chapters. It is important to build up local, autonomous, and participatory networks that, from the base, consolidate the SWS in the region as a long-term project. Finally, as for the tasks to follow, many could be mentioned, but I consider a priority. The increase of the number of members who annually pay their dues to ensure the resources to continue with the work. Identify focal points for active participation at the regional and local level, because only with local groups is it possible to position the SWS in the region. The promotion of web and knowledge in Spanish and Portuguese in addition to English as a part of the realization that the science has a social and cultural role. And to create management tools for policy makers like as an exercise in widening the applicability of knowledge. It is very interesting to expand the frontiers of science, to give place to another local stakeholders who have a ultimate and greater social and political implication in natural conservation. And lastly, I would like to thank all those who were with me in my work as a co-chair between 2016 and 2019. Thanks to Kim Poncio, Gillian Davis, and Michelle Sosek. I appreciate it. Muchas gracias a todos por su atención. Bye. Hi, Luisa. Thank you very much. So we've gotten a good idea of, of how SWS functions on two continents. So why not go to a third? <clears throat> we'll now hear from Wai Tao Fang, who was born in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. He received a BA degree in land economics and administration from National Taipei University, Taipei, Taiwan in 1989. He received his first master's degree in environmental planning from Arizona State University, USA in 1994, and the second in landscape architecture and design studies from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University in the USA in 2001. He obtained a PhD degree from the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management at Texas A&M University in 2005. He served as a specialist in the Taipei Land Management Bureau from 1991 to 1992, and as a senior specialist in charge on environmental impact assessment and environmental education in the Taiwan EPA headquarters from 1994 to 2006. He is currently a distinguished professor as the director of the Graduate Institute of Environmental Education, National Taiwan Normal University, and he is the president of the Society of Wetland Scientists Asia chapter. Mai Ta. Thanks, Casey. My name is Wei Ta Fang. Uh, good morning, everybody. My topic is how beginning an SW chapter changed the professional life of Asian ecologists. So my topic is uh, talking about the Asia because the Asia is very crowded and we have a very limited resources of forest, water and the source. Sometimes we have a lot of landscape destruction, habitat degradation 
and we still have a terrible landslide and the debris flow. So it is a very important. If we have a lot of landscape change, how can we create a new chapters in Asia? Because our resources have been converted from agriculture to urban land use and uh, industrial uses. Right now in Asia, a lot of economic activities occurred. So our air, water, and the source have the problems of degradation. In Asia, we also have the problems of the forest left. So the forest left have a lot of the problems here. Since Asia have the flyway migra migration routes from Siberia to East Asia to Australia. So how to keep the flyway and the Asian countries connection is very important. But we also made some problems of fragmentation of the ecology. Since a lot of uh, endangered species occurred here, so we need to meet the problem how to figure out and uh, solve the problems of habitat degradation. Since the East Indico International Wayland Conference and the COP15 Climate Summit have been held from the years of 2008 and 2009. We need to meet the climate rapid change. Wetlands have been explored. Their outstanding capacities to reduce greenhouse gases and provide biodiversity. So it is important to build national survey data base for the importance of wetlands in Asia. So our chapters has joined the Society of Wetland Scientists, SWS, associated with 16 countries. Our chapters organized the first SWS Asia chapters 2008 Asian Wetland Convention and the workshops in Taipei, Taiwan. And uh, we also have the SWS China chapter established during 2017. This is the history of wetland conservation. So you will see a lot of uh, experts from United States to help Asian people to build our wetlands in wide use. The rule in Asia, according to the chapter, Asian wetlands should be developed their guidelines for three objectives, such as wide use of wetland resources, construction of entire national ecological networks of important wetlands, and the enforcement of international exchanges to promote wetland conservations. So I want to make some examples. Since uh, Taiwan had joined the SWS annual meeting, after that, Taichung National Park had been designated during 2009. And uh, Taiwan had their own law to be enacted during 2015 as a Wayland Conservation Act. Taiwan has the Asian map of Tainan Coast Wetlands. You can see the history of the wetland of in, in the national importance. The landscape changed a lot. 
So you will check the Chiku Lagoon have a lot of the seascape change and the landscape change. If you are a breakfast spoon beer, you head back to Taiwan, you will see a lot of the landscape change. That is the problem occurred. So we need to find ways to, to be soft from the land forming and the water level control. So you will see a lot of biodiversity in the local villains. And in Asia, a lot of the place you may see the oyster farming in lagoons. So it is very important to do the wide use to see how oyster farming in different countries and they can keep their original lives. How about the wetlands industries in Asian countries? From the SWS help, we develop ecotourism and uh, collect some fish industries. So some species like uh, economic species and uh, we can gain some benefit from the fish industries. So how to develop wetlands environmental friendly industries in Asia is very important to do the fishmen or can male fish. So it is important to use trademark from symbolic image of the breakfast spoon beer issued by the national park. That is the, our trademark to do environmental friendly products we provide. Right now, SWS help the planning process in some purpose. SWS develop a proper methods for evaluating urbanization issues in different landscape such as the urban and the exurban planning from wetland restoration, conservation, and the education. The supporting from Dr. Ben Lapach, Dr. Rob McKinnis, Professor Maris Oti, Professor Max Frison, and uh, Gillian Davis, and uh, King Ponzio from SWS. They have changed the professional lives of Asian ecologics. Dr. Ben Lepach talking about wetland planning design and construction during 2012. We organized a workshop to help SWS supporting for local residents such as the resident in temples. So we also have uh, some experiment by boating and uh, see what happened for local people on their lives. We also collect some examples to see what is the seascape change and uh, to see how about the people life in local. Professor Maris Oti have some lectures in Asia, not only in Taiwan, but also in China. And uh, we also organized 2018 SWS joint meeting with China Tractor and the 2019 joint meeting with Korea Weiland Society. You can see 2016 in the National Wayland Convention in Taiwan. This is a cooperation with SWS 
headquarters and the Taiwan construction and the planning agency. So what is the, my final conclusions? How beginning an SW chapter changed the professional lives of Asian technologists? The answer is we get some support by the local government or by the NGOs like a Taiwan Whelan scientist, maybe from some central government and then in the national agencies. And then we try to add a lot of activity, sometimes like joint patrol organizations and uh, ecological survey, as well as landscape restorations. We want to create win-win by ecological, economics, and the social benefit. My conclusion is, what did we do for the wetland restoration? That is just for our next generation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Waita. <clears throat> With these three talks, I think we've seen a, a rich variety of opportunities and challenges that are faced by our SWS members around the globe. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and hear about a program that knits us all together. Uh, this will be given by Max Finlayson, who is a wetland ecologist with experience internationally in the science and management of water pollution from mining and agricultural activities, invasive species, climate change, and human well being. Max was the director of the Institute for Land, Water, and Society at Charles Sturt University in Australia from 2008 to 2019, and he remains an adjunct professor there. He is also chair for the wise use of wetlands at the Delft in the Netherlands. He has participated in global assessments, including the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, Global Environment Outlook, <clears throat> Water Management and Agriculture, and Global Wetland Outlook. Since the early 1990s, he has been a technical advisor to the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands and has been actively involved <clears throat> in environmental NGOs and science organizations. And he has worked, <clears throat> excuse me, and he has worked with government community-based organizations and industry to investigate the causes of ecosystem change and management, including restoration and to change policy. Hello everyone. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk to you about opportunities for SWS to influence in the international wetland science, practice and education agendas. My focus in this is to talk about the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands as one area where SWS is already contributing and, co and can contribute further if we choose. The mission of the convention says it all. It is the co conservation and wise use of all wetlands through local and national actions and international cooperation as a contribution towards achieving sustainable development throughout the world. There's a lot in that. It needs a lot of science to achieve this mission. The convention comprises 171 contracting parties or national governments and six international organizational partners, many of whom already link with our annual meetings, our annual processes, etc. There is also a memorandum of cooperation with SWS and the Ramsar Convention, signed initially in 1999, with the current version extending from 2017 for five years. The SWS Ramsar Special Interest Section was established in 2010 and represents SWS on the Convention Scientific and Technical Review Panel, known as the SDRP. We already have links, we have a lot in common. SWS and Ramsar science needs. There are opportunities to contribute directly and indirectly to the global or international uh, science needs for wetlands. The SDRP work plan is set by the Conference of Parties to the Convention every three years, roughly. SWS is part of the SDRP 
therefore part of this work plan, as a formal observer and through individual members who contribute various activities. To give you an idea of the type of the activities that we could contribute, this is a list of the current tasks. The priority tasks include the Global Wetland Outlook, which is a view of the status of wetlands. A special edition is being planned for the 50th anniversary of the Convention in 2021. Second is practical experience of restoration methods for tropical peatlands. Third is a uh, desktop study of coastal blue carbon ecosystem in Ramsar sites, that is wetlands of international importance. And four is compiling and reviewing the positive and negative impacts of agricultural practices on wetlands. Other tasks, not priority, but other tasks that the STRP is involved in include global assessment of gaps in the Ramsar site network, the site network of internationally important wetlands, preparing guidance on inventories and monitoring of small wetlands, and developing methods to rapidly assess climate vulnerability of wetlands. There's also an opportunity through the SDRP and through other mechanisms to provide advice to the Convention to the 171 governments worldwide on emerging issues. Therefore, I ask SWS members to think, what are these emerging issues? Can we identify and describe them and pass them on to the governments through the Ramsar Convention to help influence the agenda for wetlands in the future? There's also an opportunity to contribute to Ramsar training and education needs. The Convention supports many education, training and awareness raising activities. SWS provides many activities that can support or contribute and add to these. Some examples, the Ramsar Section Symposia specifically and other technical symposia as well. The Education and Outreach Symposia that we have in general are provide an opportunity to target key issues for the Convention and national governments. Our webinars and publications, our webinars are well recognised now. They are a success and we can extend the audience. SWS has also established several initiatives to target particular issues. This includes in the last year, the Climate Change Initiative and the Rights of Wetlands Initiative. These are examples of extending the agenda in a way that formal government processes may not be able to do. We're also supporting a citizen science assessment of global wetlands, which is a data gathering exercise. These are just some of the examples. I really want to ask people, what else? What can you do? How can we get together? How can we work to make new opportunities and continue what we do with more connections, connections to the international science and education agenda for wetlands? I welcome ideas on this and I thank everyone who's been involved in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Uh, it's clear that, that the Ramsar Convention has been an extremely important program in, in helping us to, to work um, globally. So uh, we've seen, <clears throat> we've seen uh, what has been and what is now, and uh, Jillian Davies is going to help us look to the future. She is a senior ecological scientist at BSC Group, Inc., where her work focuses on the intersection of climate change and wetlands. She's a visiting scholar at the Tufts University Global Development and Environment Institute and is the president-elect for the SWS Professional Certification Program. She was the 2016 to 2017 SWS president, is a co-leader for the SWS Climate Change and Wetlands Initiative and the SWS Rights of Wetlands Initiative. And she also chairs the Society of Wetland Scientists Wetlands of the United States Ad Hoc Subcommittee. Earlier in her career, Jillian was a wetlands education and outreach specialist at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and she founded her own wetlands consulting business. Jillian has a Master of Environmental Studies degree with a concentration in ecosystem ecology from the Yale School of the Environment and a bachelor's degree from Williams College. She is a professional wetland scientist and a registered soil scientist. Jillian. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I will just see, I'm gonna try moving the slides forward. Let's see. Um, okay, great. Looks like it's working. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, this is this is the slide that I'm 
hoping to speak to. Um, so over the last um, several years, as as you've seen in this in prior presentations during this webinar, um, SWS globalization has really grown, and key to the growth has been our chapter sections and committees. Um, these elements allow our members, hopefully all of you out there, um, to participate globally on wetlands issues and research and to make connections with other wetlands professionals around the world. So I would encourage everybody who's interested in getting involved in globalization of the society to, um, to look for ways of doing that in whatever way makes sense for you. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Um, but okay, there, there's the slide. Great. So over the years, SWS has uh, established a number of collaborations to work towards globalization. One of our key um, partnerships is with the Society of Wetland Scientists Professional Certification Program that it, uh, allowed initially allowed US members to achieve certification as professional wetland scientists. That group is now prioritizing globalization. And I'm happy to say that PCP um, is now certifying uh, SWS members from around the world and wetland scientists in general from around the world as professional wetland scientists. And that required uh, establishing a way to evaluate educational systems in different countries with different different approaches. Um, and then of course, uh, one of our global collaborations is with Ramsar. Max has just talked at length at that, so I, I won't um, spend time on that. We have a memorandum of cooperation with the Society for Ecological Restoration uh, with ongoing collaborations, including <clears throat> Um, support SWS's climate change and wetlands initiative that Max referenced has been working with the planners of SER 21, 2021 World Conference to be held in June um, to host a high level plenary panel. And I would encourage everyone to check that out. It's going to be a very interesting discussion with the secretary, um, the executive secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. UNEP's director of the Global Peatlands Initiative, the executive director of Wetlands International, and a world-renowned um, climate policy specialist uh, discussing climate change, biodiversity loss, loss of wetlands and peatlands, and the role of restoration. We have a long-standing partnership with the Consortium of Aquatic Science Societies, and the most recent uh, international collaboration there was that our, our climate change and, and wetlands initiative had the opportunity to provide comments on the, the American Fishery Society initiated World Aquatic Scientist Statement on Taking Action Against Climate Change. As Wei Ta mentioned, SWS has partnered with the Taiwan Construction and Planning Agency and tied Taijing National Park with Memorandum of Cooperation. That's an ongoing multi-year partnership. And I just wanted to thank Wei Ta again for all of his tireless efforts to um, collaborate between, to bring collaboration between SWS and, and Taiwanese wetland scientists and wetland scientists around Asia in general, including helping to bring into being the the China chapter. And we have a developing partnership with the South African Wetland Society, which is, is blossoming wonderfully. Um, and also some collaboration with the Alliance of World Scientists. These are all, these all represent ways that SWS members can get involved. And we'll see if this goes to the next slide. Let's see. Um, okay. 
SWS uh, has a number of these issues that SWS has been involved in have, have happened through the SWS Climate Change and Wetlands Initiative, as, as I just mentioned, and we encourage people to get involved in that initiative. And Intercall International Wetlands Conferences are a great way for SWS members to network um, globally. It's a way for the society to support our international chapters and to have a voice in global policy, wetlands policy. And in 2016, the organizers of Intercal uh, provided the Changshu Declaration on Wetlands for attendees to sign and support. And the SWS Climate Change and Wetlands Initiative followed that example and provided similar statements at three consecutive SWS annual meetings. Uh, okay. And we've been active in a number of, of other, other ways. Um, and, and, and it all, this initiative got started uh, by bringing together organizers and speakers from the 2015 Providence Annual Meeting to develop a comprehensive review paper on wetlands and climate change and then presenting a number of symposia at annual meetings. Um, and so we encourage participation and have invited the members of each section to write a chapter for a paper focused on their section's interest area and how that relates to climate change. Let's see. Okay. Um, As our thinking evolved and continued to respond to the dual challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss with the recognition that efforts thus far to conserve, protect and restore wetlands have not successfully changed the downward trajectory. We now suggest a new approach to these global problems and a new way for SWS to engage globally. Through a paradigm shift that looks to the examples of indigenous cultures around the world, and the growing rights of nature movement in the hopes of bringing about the necessary sea change in how we relate to wetlands in the natural world. What many indigenous cultures would like us to understand and what the rights of nature movement advocates for is a shift in values and in how we think about our relationship to the natural world that also then translates into changes in law. <clears throat> And now uh, the SWS Rights of Wetlands Initiative working largely through the Ramsar section has published a paper that lays out the case for wetlands to become rights bearing entities um, as part of the larger rights of nature movement. The world map and associated timeline that we included as supplementary material show the global and historical extent of the recognition of rights of nature and the expansion of rights holders through time. So what might we want to include in a declaration on the rights of wetlands? It starts with the right to exist, um, the idea that nature, and, and, and then there's several other rights, which you see up here on the screen. These rights generally follow the approach of other declarations of the rights of nature. Um, and the idea that nature both as whole ecosystems and as individual beings within these systems has inherent and inalienable rights, animacy and subjectivity may seem unfamiliar or it may seem like something that we've known all along but have been unaware of due to cultural and linguistic biases. If we look at human history, we see that societies that have recognized the rights and subjectivity of nature often have found greater balance and sustainable wise use of nature's gifts when compared to those that hold the view of nature as object, whether we're managing nature or out and out exploiting nature. All right, let's see. 
Rights of nature also figure in Western thought. In, two, in 2001, Thomas Berry authored a declaration of the rights of nature titled The Origin, Differentiation, and Role of Rights, in which he addresses the innate rights of both humans and nature, recognizing the subjectivity of all components of the universe, rather than reserving subjectivity strictly to one species. He outlines three basic rights that all living and non-living components of the earth community have. The right to be, the right to habitat or a place to be, and the right to fulfill its role in the ever renewing processes of the earth community. A particularly significant accomplishment occurred with the passing of the Te Awatapua Act the Wanganui River Claims Settlement Act in March of 2017, where the New Zealand Parliament granted the Wanganui River, including wetlands, the legal rights of personhood and legally recognized the special relationship between the Maori iwi, iwi meaning tribes, and the river. The Wanganui iwi have been advocating for legal recognition of the river's rights and their relationship to it since the 1870s. It's believed that the Wanganui River is the first river in the world to be granted the rights of personhood. Let's see. SWS offers all members opportunities to get involved in the effort to increase the presence and impact of SWS around the globe so as to better achieve the society's mission and to have an impact on wetland specific responses to the many global challenges that we face. SWS is an organization fueled by volunteers and depending on your own interests and inclinations, there's likely to be meaningful vehicle for engaging in SWS globalization. Thank you very much. And now we'll pass this over back to Kim. Okay, thank you, Jillian, and all of our speakers. Thank you, Kathy, for uh, gathering those speakers together. Um, what a diversity. That's quite amazing. I actually haven't seen this all in one place, even though working behind the scenes all these years. Um, we do have about 15 minutes left for questions and answers, so I do want to just jump right into those. Um, so I remember, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the question and answer pain, uh, say who you'd like to address it. Um, I, I can kind of figure that. I have some other questions too that I'd like to ask of my own. If for some reason you have to leave or you you know didn't get a chance to, your question get a chance to be answered, you can email any of our speakers with these addresses you see on this page. And so let's go ahead and get started. I want to address the first question. Um, I'm going to have to say this is probably Jillian because she uh, is the one that uh, brought this out, but I could probably help answer it as well. Uh, first question is, does SWS PCP now, pri are we now prioritizing globalization is how you put it. Does that mean that we're prioritizing expanding global collaborations? Sure, I'd be happy to answer that one. Um, yes, and, and there's sort of two parts to that, yes. <laughs> Um, one is that SWS has been prioritizing globalization for many years now, and SWS PCP legally is a separate organization that was founded by the society as a way to create a professional certification program that would be legally separated. Um, and SWS PCP is definitely um, prioritizing global collaborators collaboratizations um, around the certification process. So around all of the things that are within the sphere of PCP, which is a little bit different sphere from SWS's sphere. Hopefully that I, makes sense. Yeah, I think I think you did a great job answering that, Jillian. I probably good enough that I probably don't need to add much more to it. Um, I do want to say something uh, to uh, and kind of uh, circle back on something that Fred talked about, and that was our relationship with the South African Wetland Society. Um, the SWS organization uh, has that affiliate membership, and I'd like to ask him kind of how that works a little bit, but also wanted to inform Fred if he didn't know that, that just 
This September, the SWS PCP as a separate organization just signed a memorandum of cooperation with the South African Wetland Society to further a certification of program and all those things that we want to do about wetlands. We want to protect wetlands and make sure that professionals that are working in wetlands those that are delineating them and restoring them and creating them are qualified to do that. And so I just want to let him know and see if he has any um, input on how he would like to see those collaborations going forward with the uh, South African Wetland Society. So Fred, you'll have to unmute if you uh, heard my call out to you to go ahead and answer. Well, thanks, uh, Kimberly, for that question. <clears throat> I'm delighted to hear about um, the developments in respect of professional certification. I didn't know that, but I do know that the current um, co-chair of the international chapter is trying to register for professional certification. And I'm hoping that he will take this forward um, with the SWS and hopefully um, get that going in a more meaningful way in South Africa. So as, as a person involved in training of wetland professionals, um, I have managed to get statutory support from the South African um, Water Research Commission to take uh, what we do into other Southern African countries. So we are hoping that next year we will be able to run a course that will promote a professional development beyond the borders of South Africa. And I think that's very exciting. But I do think that the, this development with regard to professional certification is certainly a wonderful outcome that is clearly in the process of happening. So I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. And I, I really want to point out something um, for, you know, for the audience as well. You know, doing something individually you might feel like you're a you know one person what all can you do and i think fred made it very clear that the impact just a few individuals in his region of the world have made such an impact and um that, that now we're you know making more and more efforts for globalization i think louisa also talked about that and you know getting the revitalization of the south america or latin america and caribbean uh, section of the international chapter going as well and so and I just think about all the stuff that that uh, Wei Ta has done over the years to to single-handedly sometimes but in collaboration as well um, getting things done so I, I would say don't think that your contribution as one person can be insignificant because it can make a huge difference and so I, I really uh, like that you pointed that out Fred. Um, I do want to ask a question of um, Wei Ta, I mean, there have been many, many things that have, have happened and I, I would wanted to ask you about the collaboration that you have done with, the, with Korea and with China and doing some of your uh, meetings and workshops. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that worked with yes. the government uh, yeah. entities and things like that? Yeah, thanks, King. I think so. it's, it's uh, interesting because in Asia, we have the different language. Sometimes uh, English is not our original language, our second language. So we need to communicate just uh, by our limited English and uh, cooperate with each country. Since uh, Rongsa East Asia Center is very crucial and important for us. So mm -hmm. we put a lot of efforts with uh, Rongsa East Asia Center and uh, this center covered 18 countries. Since SWS Asia chapter just covered 16 countries. So we need to get some help from the Rongsa East Asia Center and sometimes from Rongsa Japan. So it is very important, not only from SWS Asia chapter, but maybe from Rongsa, maybe from Indico and the other agencies in the world. Thank you, Wei Ta. I mean, one of the things that was really important is a, a lot of times because we originally you know, originated in the United States, we kind of think everyone should speak English. <laughs> and I mean, everybody has been very accommodating, but I, I think one of the things I'm happy to see is 
uh, a lot of our materials being uh, translated into other languages as a start. I mean, it's a very small start, but it's a very important start. So maybe Louisa, I think she's online. Um, and all you can you can unmute yourselves and you can start your videos if you'd like to. So not everybody has to watch me while you're answering the question. But um, please, uh, Louisa, if you could talk to us a little bit about that in one of the steps in what you made suggestions is where we were translating things into Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, thank you, Kim. I think that um, for Latin America, it's important to uh, to communicate the weapon knowledge in another languages because I see that English comes just to the scientists but not to the policymakers. Mm -hmm. And I think that the policymakers play an important role at the regional and local level. I think that is really important. I'm going to ask Jillian because uh, she's been so involved in policy. Um, how um, and, and kind of maybe Jillian, if you could give us an idea of how important it's been for SWS to to get involved in policy through our different collaborations with CAS and other groups, um, can you can you speak to that? Sure, I I think it's critical um, because of the point in, in the Earth's history that we are at right now with the destabilizing climate and really um, massive amounts of biodiversity loss and the continued downward trajectory of, of the condition of, of wetlands in the world. It's really important for wetland scientists to connect to policymakers. And Louisa makes a great point that to do so, we need to speak in many languages. And there are really important decision makers out there um, who are affecting how wetlands are managed. And uh, if we want to see those management practices improve and increased conservation of wetlands, then that's that I think is, is a challenge that SWS needs to take on is how to translate into other languages um, so that we can communicate with some of these other really important uh, decision makers, scientists, policy makers, and all of that. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that actually uh, follows really well. And maybe Kathy can lead up the answer to this question from one of our attendees. Um, it says, obviously, SWS has been incredibly impactful for scientists across the globe. In your work over the years, have you seen the opinion of wetlands change from a non-scientist viewpoint? And if so, how would you describe those opinions? And in, in, uh, when I was a, uh, this is Kathy, let me put my video on. Um, mm -hmm. When I was uh, still working, I, I started to work more internationally and I started to work with um, uh, uh, natural resource economists and and they were a tremendous help in translating our, our research results into something that was meaningful for uh, the individual communities. And, and um, it's not easy. I remember when we made the point in, on the small island of Koh Chai that, uh, that natural, <laughs> that the ecosystem services were, that mangrove forests provided were worth a million dollars a year mm -hmm. to the islanders. Well. Uh, pretty soon somebody was out there trying to cut down his share of that million dollars. So, <laughs> so it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not an easy thing. I was very impressed with the uh, second plenary session at the um, uh, virtual connections um, uh, conference that we just had. Ritesh um, brought out very well, I think, the need not just for things like economics, but the social context within which people use wetlands, uh, that really made a big impression on me. So I think we're getting there, but, but in order to really connect with people, I think we, we have to look to the social sciences to be full partners. I think that's an excellent point. And I hope that answered uh, uh, Matt's question about that. Um, I think the, uh, we, are, we have one minute left. Um, I would like to just give a, uh, you know, I would like to at least give Max the, 
the the opportunity to answer but it's in the middle of the night there so he is not joining us live um but i do want to uh kind of give a little shout out for ramsar and the importance of getting ramsar and other groups of international uh importance in that we get involved with them and that has been one of our greatest collaborations uh and i also agree too with with you kathy and others that have and i think way Ta made it very clear that uh, some of the provisioning services that wetlands do are not, they, they're known by the general public, but they're not really recognized that, that we value them the same way. Um, looking at other things may not necessarily be the thing that speaks to them. And there are cultures that do a lot of more of the provisioning and recognize that, whereas other cultures don't recognize that as much. And so I think the value of the ecosystem services throughout the entire part of the social service aspect of it as well uh, needs to be uh, considered when we're thinking about wetlands and conservation and the attitudes of, of, the, um, of the public in general. I mean, scientists are notoriously not that great at communicating and we're getting better and better at it. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I'm excited to see what everyone on this panel and others have done to you know, just, just really um, encourage folks to get involved in wetlands, even if you're not a, a wetland scientist or a wetland professional for that matter, uh, because we need the support of all those folks to, to get our mission accomplished. So um, Kathy, as the orchestrator of this, would you like to uh, just give a last sec minute uh, roundup or uh, do we, should we just end it there? Well, uh, I'll just say that uh, I want to uh, express my thanks to all of the uh, participants. This is a, a varied and unique group. And I think we've heard of, uh, about a variety, as I mentioned before, of opportunities and challenges. And, and I hope that we're all ready to take up the challenges. So thank you, Kim, for, for moderating this too. Excellent. Okay, well, um, if Jordan, if you'd put up the uh, next slide, I just want to give a I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank Kathy for organizing this. And before we sign off, I want to give you a couple announcements of the up to upcoming SWS events. Um, our next webinar uh, will be held on January 21st and will be presented by Rafaela Nicola. We'll be presenting our work on Brazilian wetlands. And our next Spanish webinar will be held on March 24th. And uh, as a reminder, those Spanish webinars are offered free of charge to members and non-members alike. And finally, uh, next slide, please. Be sure to subscribe and follow our social media channels like Facebook and LinkedIn to keep informed about the happenings of the society and to support the society. And if you're not a member and you're just joining us today as a non-member, please check out our webpage and find out about how to become a member and all the benefits of membership. We also have our YouTube channel where our webinars are posted three months after their original broadcast with multilingual subtitles. And uh, just this past year, we've added the wetland interviews. We have five interviews, two in English and three in Spanish posted on our YouTube page. And you can quickly link to those on the SWS website under resources tab. And if you're Spanish speaking, be certain to subscribe to the Latin America and Caribbean regions Facebook page, which Louisa talked about at the link listed here. And then finally, thanks again to our presenters, uh, to our webinar sponsors for 2020. And don't forget, we're looking for two new sponsors for 2021. And then thank you to our audience for participating today. Have a wonderful day and stay well during the holiday season. Thank you.